In this video, we're going to be going through polynomial functions. I know it's listed polynomial and rational functions, but rational functions is going to be a battle for another day. What we're going to be doing today is exploring the basic vocabulary of polynomial functions um, in the hopes that we will be able to use this vocabulary in analyzing polynomials throughout the bulk of the chapter, which is chapter three. Today we're going to learn the basic vocabulary of describing power functions given an equation. We're going to describe the long run behavior of polynomials given their equation and or graph. Now long run, you may not have heard this term before. Um, you may have heard the term end behavior. Um, I think that's actually a more apropos um, title for it, but um, our textbook uses long run, so we're going to stay consistent with that. You could also think of this as end behavior. Then we're going to determine the intercepts of polynomial functions written in factored form. So they're already going to be factored for us, which is going to be really, really nice. Throughout the larger proportion of the chapter, what we're going to end up doing is utilizing different techniques to break down polynomials and factor them. Um, but for right now, we're just going to start with polynomials that are already factored. So here's our basic vocabulary of a polynomial. A polynomial is a function that can be written in this form, where each of these a values represent constants, and they are all multiplied by some power of x. Technically, a sub 0 is being multiplied by a power of x. It just is a power of 0, for whatever it's worth. Each of these a values are called coefficients. They can be positive, negative, or zero. They can be whole numbers, decimals, or fractions. They can be anything, really. A term of a polynomial is one piece of the sum. That is for any sort of like coefficient and power of x. Each individual term is a transformed power function. When we talk about transformations, we're talking about um, vertical stretch or compression and reflection about the x-axis. The degree of the polynomial is the highest power of the variable that occurs in a polynomial. Okay, Degree, this is a really, really important one. We're going to be using um, this particularly often. The leading term is the term containing the highest power of the variable. So effectively, what we're saying here is if I can find the leading term, then I will have the degree. And then the leading coefficient is the coefficient of the leading term. So because of the definition of leading term, I, you know, I like the usage of quotations here, we rearrange polynomials so that powers are descending. So if I had something like um, x to the third plus five x to the fourth minus one, this is not what's called standard form. If I were gonna rewrite this in standard form, it would be five x to the fourth plus x cubed minus one. These are descending powers of x. Okay, so we put the larger power out front and then we just make them go down until we get to the constant. Okay, again, this is what's called standard form of a polynomial. Um, this will be helpful uh, later on in the chapter. So let's suppose I have these two polynomials here. What I want to discern is first the degree, then I want to dis discern the leading term. You'll see that abbreviated as LT. And then what I want you to do is discern the leading coefficient. Go ahead and pause the video and come up with the degree, leading term, and leading coefficient of all of these polynomials. All right, first, for f of x, we see that the degree is going to be 2. The leading term is where we got the degree from. Okay, And then we have the leading coefficient. That's the coefficient of the leading term. That's going to be 3. Now, students for leading term are going to want to say 2 because it's the term that's out front. But this is why we put leading in quotations there. So do not fall into that trap. Okay, we define the leading term of a, co of a polynomial as the term containing the power function of highest degree. This second one's a little trickier. Technically, this doesn't look like a polynomial, but it is kind of. It's got a power of x. It's just x to the zero power. 
My degree here is zero. My leading term is negative 11, and my leading coefficient is negative 11. If you wanted to write x to the zero for the leading term, you could. Um, Lumen does not give that any credit, okay? Uh, it, it, it wouldn't like mark you wrong, it just wouldn't acknowledge it in the coding. So, take a second and identify the degree, leading term, and leading coefficient of these polynomials. Pause the video and do this on your own. All right, for g of t, the degree is going to be five because the highest power of t is five. The leading term is gonna be five t to the fifth. And because I discerned the leading term, I'm just gonna take the coefficient of that leading term, which is gonna be five. Similarly, with h of p, the highest power of p is three. The term that gave me that was this negative p cubed. And I can think of this as negative one times p cubed. It makes my leading coefficient easier to discern. My leading coefficient is gonna be negative one. Now, why is this language even remotely helpful? So long run behavior is effectively discussing what the arrows are doing in a polynomial. In a polynomial, you're always going to have, or a polynomial graph, you're always going to have two arrows. You're going to have a rightmost arrow and a leftmost arrow. They are always going to extend indefinitely. The domain of a polynomial will always be from negative infinity to positive infinity. So you're always going to have these two arrows. Observe that I'm not saying that the range is always going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity. That is not true, but the domain always will be. So what happens is, I want to talk about what's going on with these arrows in particular. So the way that we would write this, let's talk about this arrow first. As x goes to the right, as my x values are going to the right, my y value is going up, okay? The way that I would write this in math land is right here. As x approaches infinity, f of x, which is really just another way of saying y, is gonna be approaching infinity. Next, as x goes to the left, let choose a different color for this one. As x goes to the left, so that's this arrow here, my y value is going down. As x goes to the left, y goes down to negative infinity, okay? If I were gonna write this as a proper solution, I would write this as two separate statements. I would say as x approaches infinity, f of x approaches, well, okay, as I go to the right, I go up. And as x goes to the left, I should probably use, I should probably do this right, huh? As x goes to the left, that's negative infinity. f of x goes down, okay? This is how I would properly express my solution. You should have two separate statements that are both saying the appropriate thing because we have two arrows. If we're gonna talk about the long run, there's two long runs we can have. There's as I go to the right and as I go to the left. Try to think of it as left and right being the dominant one. If you think up and down, I think you're gonna get yourself confused. Now, we wanna find the long run behavior for each of these functions. Now, right out of the gate, it looks like we're gonna have a problem here because we only have the equations. We don't have the graphs of these things. It would be nice to have the graphs of these, I guess, but we don't actually need these. We don't actually need the picture of the graph. There's this really neat sort of pattern that takes place with long run behavior. For any polynomial, the long run behavior of the polynomial will match the long run behavior of the leading term. So take a second and identify the leading terms of each of these polynomials. For each of these polynomials, we have the term 3x squared. If I were just going to graph just 3x squared, the graph would look like this, which makes sense. This is a good quadratic parabola, um, vertically uh, stretched, um, by a factor of three. So that's what this graph is gonna look like. Now, 
Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the graph of this thing is going to look like that. I'm not saying that at all. That's actually not the case. But what I know is whatever this graph is doing, the end behavior is going to do the same thing as just this graph. So whatever's happening in the middle of this graph, I have no idea, but I know that both of the arrows are going to be behaving the same way. Okay. Now, how would I write this? So the end behavior of this particular polynomial, the 3x squared plus x minus 2, it's going to be the same as this end behavior here. So take a second and write this out using proper mathematical um, diction. So first I'm going to talk about this arrow. There's no reason I can talk about the arrows, you know, in any order I want. As x approaches infinity, f of x, well, as I go to the right, I'm going up. And then I'll address this arrow. As x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches negative infinity. Okay. Now, we discerned our leading term here was negative 2x to the fourth. That's what the graph of 2x to the fourth is going to look like. Okay. Now, or I'm sorry, negative 2x to the fourth. x to the fourth is really going to look a lot like a parabola, just in general. Same thing as x to the sixth, x to the eighth. It's really just a question of what's happening here. But again, what's interesting to us is these arrows. Now, why is the why are these arrows pointing down? Well, the negative two says that I reflected, well, the negative actually tells me that I reflected this about the x-axis. So that's going to be the shape. All right. So now I'm going to write this using um, proper end behavior notation. So I'll start with this arrow. As x goes to the right, well, okay, my f of x is going down to negative infinity. Now I'm going to address this arrow as x goes to the left. Well, I'm going down. That means f of x is approaching negative infinity. Why? Now, take a second and identify the leading terms of these polynomials. Okay, again, same thing. Leading term is going to be 6x to the fifth. Now, what does x to the fifth look like? Well, x to the fifth is really just going to be basically an x to the third, a cubic graph. Um, it's just going to have, again, a little bit more, you could think of it as intensity here in the middle. But again, we're only talking about the arrows. The arrows are always going to have the same pattern. So there's my leading term, 6x to the fifth. This is the actual graph of 6x to the fifth, but I didn't even need this much. Here are my arrows. And so let's write this in proper end behavior notation. So let's do the right arrow first. As x approaches infinity, well, as I go to the right, I'm going up f of x approaches infinity. All right, now let's see, I go to the left. Six approaches negative infinity. f of x is going down, it's going to negative infinity. Okay, same basic thing over here. This is a nice cubic graph, so we already know that that's gonna be, uh, it's gonna have sort of this shape to it. Oof sort of this shape to it. Again, since it's negative, it's actually going to be reflected about the x-axis. So the shape of it is going to be more like this. Okay. Again, we pop our arrows on. And now we're going to write this in proper notation. Let's do this arrow first. Why not? As x goes to the left, f of x is going up. And then over here, let's do this arrow as I go to the right. You notice I'm not saying anything different if I change the order in which I write these things. Okay. 
That's how we write this as end behavior. Now, there's going to be a definitive pattern here. Ultimately, your degree of a polynomial is either going to be even or odd. And then for your leading coefficient, you're either going to have a positive or a negative leading coefficient. And you can think of the negative leading coefficient as the thing that reflected it about the x-axis. And the positive coefficient just means we didn't. So here's what's really neat. For an even degree positive leading coefficient, I don't care what's happening in the middle of the graph. This is always going to happen with the arrows. This will always be my end behavior. Okay, as x approaches negative infinity, y approaches infinity. As I go to the left, I go up. As I go to the right, I go up. Now, let's suppose I took this graph here and reflected it about the x-axis. That's how I get down to this picture. So, same type of thing here. This will always be the end behavior given that the degree is even and the leading coefficient is negative. Similarly, with the odd degree, the arrows are pointing opposite directions. Okay, it's a question of which one is pointing down. Well, for odd degree positive coefficient, the arrow that's going to the left um, is going down and the arrow going to the right is going up. If I reflect this thing about the x-axis, like I would do here if I negated my leading coefficient, the graph would look like this, which would just be, you could think of this as opposite, here, the left arrow is, or the leftmost arrow is the one that's going up, and the rightmost arrow is the one that's going down. A way that you could remember this is if I have an even degree polynomial, the arrows are both going to be pointing the same direction. There's not really a cutesy way that I know of to do it with odd, um, but if it's odd degree, they're going to be pointing opposite directions. Okay. You could even think of it like if I had the word odd and I sort of held it up to a mirror, there's, you know, it's not exact how this would work, but you could think of it as like opposite, right? The arrows are going to be pointing opposite directions. Again, I know you would also have to sort of like change the direction of these, but whatever. It's just a teaching tool. It's just something to remember. This skill, honestly, has very little to do with deep, profound mathematical knowledge. This is a memorization thing. You need to have this committed to your memory. And if I give you some polynomial, you need to be able to tell me its end behavior just by looking at it, which means what you need to do is discern the degree, look at the degree, and tell me whether or not it's even or odd, and then look at the leading coefficient and tell me whether or not it's positive or negative, and then state the end behavior just from that. So this table is going to be really, really helpful um, to have committed to your memory. Okay, so really make sure that you have this table sort of like, I, I, I'm reticent to use the term memorized, but internalized, which I guess is just kind of an academically snobby way of saying memorized. Now, we're going to talk about intercepts of functions. So let's suppose I gave you this polynomial here. And it's written in factored form quite literally for your convenience. Let's determine the vertical and horizontal intercepts. Again, vertical intercepts is kind of an ambiguous way of saying y-intercept. And what happens at a y-intercept? Well, that's going to be where x is equal to 0. And horizontal intercepts, this is going to be an x-intercept. And this is going to be where y is equal to 0. Analogously, f of x is equal to zero, okay? Now, I want you to think about the possibilities here. How many y-intercepts can we have at most? And we'll talk about how many x-intercepts we can have later on. But for y-intercepts, you can only ever have one y-intercept. Because if I didn't have, if I had two y-intercepts, so suppose I had some function, right? And let's say it hit the y-axis here and here, right? No matter how I draw this thing, it's going to fail the vertical line test, which means it's not a function. Since it's supposed to be a polynomial function, then we know that it's going to have to um, 
only have exactly y, one y-intercept. You'll notice that we, get a, we don't get away with that same thing with an x-intercept. We can have a whole bunch of those. So for a y-intercept, we're setting up a coordinate pair. We don't know what the y value is, but we know the x value is zero. So let's just go ahead and plug zero into this function. I'm going to use order of operations here. So you don't need to like FOIL and then plug in. 0 minus 2 is negative 2. 0 plus 1 is 1. 0 minus 2 is negative 2, but I wrote it wrong because I'm a dummy. There we go. Negative 4. Negative 2 times 1, that's negative 2 times negative 4. That's going to be a positive 8. Okay, great. So that's going to be my y-intercept. Now I'm going to set out to find my x-intercepts. Now here's the thing about an x-intercept. What I know about an x-intercept is the y-value is going to be 0. So what I'm going to say here is, OK, 0 equal to x minus 2 times x plus 1 times x minus 4. So what I've got here is these three numbers multiply to give me 0. What does that tell me about each of those numbers? Well, by the zero product property, it tells me that each of those numbers has, well, at least one of those numbers has to be equal to zero. So let's see how that works. We're going to say, okay, well, x minus 2 equals zero. I add 2 to both sides, I get x is equal to 2. Great. That's one of them. Now I set my x plus 1 equal to zero, subtract 1 from both sides x is equal to negative 1. All right, so now I've got another x-intercept. And now I set the x minus 4 equal to 0. Add 4 to both sides. Cool, x is equal to 4. And those are my x-intercepts and my y-intercepts. Something I want you to observe is if um, I'm asking you to find particular intercepts. What you're going to need to do is state these as coordinate pairs. An intercept is a place. It's where something happens on a graph. So it doesn't make sense to just tell me um, an x value or just a y value for an intercept because it's where. If someone asks where, you know, how do you get to this particular restaurant in Richmond, you don't just say, oh, go north. Well, no, but you're, you're also going to go into either the eastern part of the city or the western part of the city. So where are you going? North and east, north and west. Don't just give a y value or don't just give an x value. If I'm asking for an intercept, give a coordinate pair, always. Now we want to find the vertical and horizontal intercepts of this function. Pause the video and do this. All right, again, because we're not barbarians, we're gonna think of vertical intercept as y-intercept and a horizontal intercept as x-intercepts. So let's start with the y-intercept. Again, we're only gonna have one because this thing is a function, because it's a function. And I know that the n value is gonna be equal to zero here. All right, so I know that zero is the and value, now I need to go ahead and find the k of n. Nope, I don't want to skip it. I want to do it. Still don't want to skip it, still want to do it. So then I plug 0 in. Okay. I get negative 3. 4 minus 0 is 4. 4 times 0 is 0, plus 3. So then negative 3 times 4, that's negative 12, times 3, that's negative 36. That's my y-intercept. Now let's find my x-intercepts. So this is where students will get themselves into trouble. This is where k of n is equal to 0, which means I get boom, boom. I'm going to use the zero product property. But here's the thing I need to remember. All three of these numbers, at least one of them has to be zero in order for me to have um, 
an x-intercept. If I set this first thing equal to zero, negative three is never equal to zero. So I don't need to worry about it. Now here's something I wanna drive home. Just because there's only one thing here, that does not mean that um, there's not gonna be an x-intercept. Let's suppose this was negative three n. Well, now that's a totally different beast altogether because what happens is I can absolutely set negative three n equal to zero. I would just divide both sides by negative three and I'd get n is equal to zero. So I've got an x-intercept there, okay? But just you know, to stay focused on what it is we're doing, there's not an n there, so no need. Negative three is absolutely not ever equal to zero. So I've gotten everything that I need out of that factor, which is nothing. That factor is not helpful. It is helpful when I'm breaking it down, but that's not what I'm doing right now. It's already broken down for me. So now I set four minus n equal to zero. I'm gonna be sneaky and just add n to both sides. I get n is equal to four. All right, so four is my n value. And then I set four n plus three equal to zero, subtract three from both sides. Divide both sides by four. Boom. So then I got my other x-intercept at negative three-fourths, zero. Okay, so that's how we find intercepts of functions when they're already factored for me. Now, <clears throat> There's something interesting about x-intercepts and turning points. Um, what turning points are are where you're changing from increasing to decreasing or um, decreasing to increasing respectively. So a polynomial of degree n is gonna have one at most n horizontal intercepts, at most, okay? An odd degree polynomial will always have at least one. Um, that makes a lot of sense if you think about it, because if you think about an odd degree polynomial, right, the arrows are both going to be pointing opposite directions, and we'll even do both cases here. Well, it doesn't matter what happens exactly, but what's going to have to happen is I'm going to have to pass through the middle. So I'm going to have to touch it at least once. Let's even say I do touch it only once. Well, I have to pass through the middle because both arrows are pointing opposite directions. So yes, that's absolutely true. Second thing is at most n minus one turning points. So the polynomial is of degree n. So what's the least possible degree of this polynomial shown? So let's start with one. Let's start with our x-intercepts. How many different x-intercepts are there? Well, there's one here, two, three, four, five. So here we have one case and could be at most five. Okay, it could be at most five, all right? So it could be, and could actually be equal to four and could be three and could be two, whatever. Um, but we've got at most five horizontal intercepts, okay? Or no, I'm sorry, if, yes. So my mistake, the n value could actually be six or seven or eight or nine or 10, um, but since it's got five horizontal intercepts, then that means that the degree is gonna be at most five, okay, perfect. And now for our second point, we could look at at least n minus one turning points. So how many turning points are there? One, two, three, four. So there are four turning points. So what we have is four is gonna be equal to n minus one. I'm gonna add one to both sides n is equal to five. I wanna know what the least possible degree is. Well, for case one, I had that n was equal to five. Case two, I had n was equal to five. What's the smallest of those two numbers? n is equal to five, okay? 
This is the least possible degree of the graph. Now, could it be a sixth degree? Could it be a seventh degree? Could it be an eighth degree? Absolutely, it could be. Absolutely, it could be because of the at most, right? But we're looking for the least possible degree, so we have to keep that in mind. All right, now let's figure out what the least possible degree of the polynomial S is given here. So, or the polynomials, sorry. Take a second, pause the video, try this on your own. We're gonna start with A, obviously. All right, so first we're gonna start with A. I see that there are two x-intercepts. So for our first case, we have that n is equal to two, but it could be three or four or five or six or whatever, right? We have no idea. Two feels low, but that's okay. If it were two, it'd be a quadratic, but whatever. Let's even assume that's not it. Now let's take a look at the turning points. Well, there's one, two, three. So now here's what we've got for our second case. We have that three is equal to n minus one, one less than what the possible degree is. I'm going to add one to both sides. n is equal to four. Now here's the thing. I want to know what the least possible degree is. You'd think, okay, well, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to say n equals two, but no, that's not true. We said in one possibility, n is equal to two or anything bigger. And in the other case, we said n is equal to four or anything bigger. We have to go with n is equal to four. I understand that two is less than four, certainly. But when we look at the picture and we just use x-intercepts, we say, okay, well, the lowest it could possibly be is two. But then we count the turning points and we go, uh-oh, no, hold on, wait. The lowest it could possibly be is four, okay? Now, here's the thing. For this guy here, for part B, ultimately, if I were gonna use the zero product property here, let's find how many x-intercepts I would have. As we saw in the earlier problem, I wouldn't worry about setting this factor equal to zero because negative two is never going to be equal to zero. But here, if I set this factor equal to zero, it actually doesn't even really matter at this point, but I'd get an x-intercept of one third. Again, it doesn't really matter at this point where it is, but ultimately I would be setting one, two factors equal to zero and so I'd have two x-intercepts. Based on that information alone, the only thing I can say here is that the n value is going to be equal to, or the least possible degree is going to be two. Okay. Take a second and try these as well. All right, so from A, again, we start with our x-intercepts. All right, so there's only one. So that tells me the degree of the, the least possible degree could be one, right? But it also could be two or three or four or whatever, right? All right, now let's see our turning points. I don't see any turning points. There's no turning points. Well, that's equal to n minus one, add one to both sides, n equals one. So these are in perfect agreement. The least possible degree of this thing is gonna be one which makes sense because if you think about a first degree polynomial, that would be something like a sub zero times x plus uh, a sub one, just based on our definition of a polynomial. Well, what if instead we called this m and we called this b, this is a linear function. That's a linear function. It's a polynomial of degree one. All right, now, again for this one, I'm not gonna set the factor two to zero because that's dumb. Two is not gonna be equal to zero. But each of these three things I would set equal to zero. And again, I don't actually need to figure out what each of these things is gonna be. It would, I mean, it would take me a second anyway. But 
it's not, I don't need to do it. There's one, two, three factors set equal to zero. N is going to be equal to three. Okay. I know it feels a little weird to look at this just as what it is, but I promise when you go into the homework, it's going to make a little bit more sense. All right, now, what is the maximum number of x-intercepts and turning points for a polynomial of degree five? Take a second and answer this question. So the maximum number of x-intercepts, degree five, the most number of times it can touch the x-axis, it can only touch the x-axis at most five times, so the maximum would be five x-intercepts. And then turning points, well, if the degree itself is five, right, then what we have is the maximum number of turning points, which we'll call K, is gonna be the degree minus one, right? But here's the thing, we already know in this case that the degree is five. Uh, why'd you do that? We already know that the degree is 5, so it's just going to be 5 minus 1. k is equal to 4. So we could have at most 5 x-intercepts and at most 4 turning points. And now if you look at the second question, I'm really asking you the same question. I just gave you a little bit of a different piece of information. Go ahead and try this one on your own. Here we see that the degree is three because that is the highest power of the polynomial. So we are gonna have at most three x-intercepts. And again, we have the maximum number of turning points. Well, that's gonna be the degree minus one. And we're gonna have at most two turning points. I know this feels very cursory and it feels kind of like hodgepodgey, but what we're doing is we're just introducing polynomials. Good luck.